is in lighter conditions now, not as they have been in the past. The highway team do not seem to think this is a reason for objections, and therefore the recommendation is for approval. Similarly, on page 52, we read the retrospective development, why isn't this clear on page 50, is not considered to be detrimental visually or have an adverse impact on the immunity of the occupiers of 137 that they can reasonably expect to enjoy. Naturally, I beg to differ and hope I can persuade the committee to reject this application. I would firstly <coughs> like to thank the director who came out to meet the objectors on site very kindly in order to address their concerns and objections which seem to have been expressed over a considerable period but without much progress and in fact they wrote to Kevin Adley in March 2011. This application is as a result of his assistance and I am grateful for his help. I have numbered the photos which I have copied for the committee in lieu of a site visit in order to facilitate following my commentary. My apologies for the quality of some of the photos my printer was struggling to cope. And I'm sorry there aren't more, but it simply wouldn't have at all that we need to get to. Slide one are Mr. and Mrs. Oliver, the residents and objectors who live at 137 Seabank Road. Slide two is 137 Seabank Road with the original sign wall on their property and showing the side entrance to their porch facing the side of number 135. And I was wondering when planning permission <coughs> was given to Mr. Kendrick to build his side wall. Application 110163 gives permission for front stroke side, stroke rear, single story extensions. Nowhere does it mention a side wall. Application 130069 gives permission for a boundary wall at the front of the property, i.e. the boundary wall fronting off to Seabank Road, not the side wall. So as far as I can see from the paperwork we've been given, there is no planning application permission for that side wall. Photo three, and I would say that's because the paperwork has been misread by planning officers and it's botched. Three shows the rear garden of 137 Seabank Road, belonging to Mr. and Mrs. Oliver, with an arrow to indicate their own brick-built shed. Photo four, shows the interior of the shed with structural damage caused as a result of the work done at the back of 135 following planning application 110163. The metal bracing is to stabilise and was installed by Mr and Mrs Oliver. As far as I am aware, they have not been compensated for this damage. Photo five is the rear extension to number 135 which you are requested to approve as a variance to application 110163, including the extension at the back of the garage. Photo six. This shows the original side boundary wall with the Oliver's wall within their own boundary at the front of the house. Mr. Kendrick's side wall abuts the original arts and crafts wall, and therefore it is likely and it is built partially on the Oliver's property. Indeed, according to the deeds of 137 and their own measurements, this appears to be the case. We've been advised, therefore, by the director that they will need to pursue a civil case, whatever the outcome of this planning application, in order to establish the boundary. Seven, this indicates the strange extended roof over the garage which did, which did not have planned permission, application 110163. It also shows the single brick wall extension of the original arts and crafts wall between the properties and some kind of concrete infill. Mr. Kendrick proposes to use his extended garage as a workshop, and the Olivers are concerned about their loss of immunity due to noise. Photograph eight. This disorienting view is the view from the porch door now of number 137 with the brick extension to the original boundary wall. Photos 9 and 10. These show the extent of the walling in of Mr. and Mrs. Oliver in 137 
and also the reverse view of the garage roof extension. The coping stones were removed from the top of the original wall while the residents of 137 were on holiday, and the wall extended upwards by the time they came back. The coping stones were then replaced on the top of the wall, again on the occasion when the Oliver's were away. showing the sight lines to pavements as well as the carriageway on Seabank Road. 13. Pedestrian view of the frontage of 135, 137, showing the car belonging to number 137 clearly visible on the drive. 14. Ongoing work to the frontage of 135, seemingly never ending and causing continual dust and aggravation, as well as causing noise and distress and having an adverse effect on both. Mr. and Mrs. Oliver's health. 15. The pillar at the end of the wall to 135, with large space for a planter indicated for a tree perhaps. This shows already the restricted view for anyone now leaving in a car from 137. 16. This is now the view for a pedestrian on the pavement approaching 135 and 137. As you can see quite clearly, any car on the drive of 137 is now invisible into the last minute. Similarly, the pedestrian will now be invisible to any car driver leaving the property. This could be, in either case, a mother leaving with small children and a bus chair, or an elderly person, or somebody with sight or hearing difficulties, or other physical dis disability in a wheelchair, on their way to the adult social services centre in Cambridge Road. 17. View of the walls from above, showing the site of the proposed solid wooden gate and the planter at the front of 135. As Mr. Kendrick had planted the Leyland Yai around two sides of the back garden of 135, I have concerns that this is his plan for these planters. 18. Extended wooden fencing adjacent 137, which appeared while they were away on holiday, soon after the Kendricks acquired 135. They were unhappy that the cottage Copper Beach Hedge was there. I'm showing this as an example of the way Mr. and Mrs. Oliver had their lives constantly disrupted by these issues. 19 shows coping stones, which Mr. and Mrs. Oliver removed from their own property one evening in the rain and dark, having returned from the day out shopping, etc., this winter. 20 and 21, Mr. Oliver in the dark cleaning his own property after Mr. Kendrick had mortared on the coping stones to the top of their wall while they were out. They wanted to remove the mortar before it had time to set on the running wall. Allegedly, Mr. Kendrick, when they object, they got the opinion, no one cares what you think, well, I do. 22, I will leave the committee to draw their own conclusions about this behavior. It shows Mr. Kendrick's van parked as close as possible to the Kendrick Oliver's drive making it even more difficult to pull out onto the carriageway safely from their hands. Although Mr. Kendrick believes the answer to their problem is to reverse onto their own drive, this is not a solution. Firstly, the steep steepness of the slope means that car exhausts ground when reversing. And secondly, because of the volume of traffic now using the Seabank Road, I ask a PCSO to come out and visit Mr. and Mrs. Oliver and Mr. Kendrick as a result of this continual um, parking issue. And he said, regardless of the gate, the wall on the side of the property is an impediment to drivers leaving 137. No line of sight of pedestrians on the footpath. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Pat. We don't need no, we don't need any questions. I've got a we're off to the final committee now, so thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to move to the panel. Is there any comments? Well, although we 
we've always taken the view on the, this committee, and we're not very pleased when represented with retrospective plan applications, when things are taking place without the proper planning commission permission being sought. And we can we can understand why that would annoy you. It would annoy me if a neighbour of mine did, did a similar thing. But, but the the professional judgment seems to be that this if this was a new application, then it would be within the remit and, and, and planning guidance to be be given approval. So that's the difficult situation we find ourselves in. Having said that, when I looked at the, the report, um, it says approved, but for what is a I know it's not to the, the neighbouring property a small application, but in the terms of applications, it's a relatively uh, small application. We have up to 12, um, and a further note, 12 conditions. And I'm just wondering whether those conditions are, are, are they usual for an application this size, or are they, are they going some way to, um, to assist? Three, sorry, I do apologise. Are there anything in the conditions that, that would mitigate the, the comments from the uh, from the ward councillor who's obviously reflecting the views of the applicants? Um, not the applicants, of the. Uh, uh, thank you, Julie um, Chair. Um, <coughs> let me just clarify the issue of the side wall, which the ward councillor alluded to. The, 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 the side wall, the wall between um, uh, 135 and 137. Uh, that, that's permitted development, so it doesn't require planning permission. Both the wall, um, it's the wall on the front, which is 2.4 metres in height, that requires planning permission. That has a previous approval, um, but there's a change to the gates from wall height to timber. Um, and then, substantially, it's the extension at the rear of the property, which has had a previous approval, but when built, um, differed from that, that, that approval. Um, there was a, uh, a non-material amendment application submitted, but we considered that the, the changes to, to that proposal went beyond a non-material amendment and required permission. So that's why um, that element of the application is, is retrospective. But in terms of some of the, condition, uh, some of the concerns around um, access onto the road, um, there is a condition, it's condition three, I think, on the agenda. Um, which, which says that the gate should open um, within the site rather than onto the pavement. So we feel that that, that mitigates um, um, that, that issue. I mean, there are photographs that we've got that, 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 can, that I can show the committee that shows um, walls and access arrangements along, along Seabank Road, um, similar to this application. Um, and so um, having regard to those, uh, we came to the conclusion that it would be very difficult to, to resist this development, given that there are um, uh, similar arrangements along the back road. The, 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 the next question is, I mean, I've diligently, while we've been listening to the debate, tried to read through this. Um, from what I've read of these, they seem to be sort of character references of the people who are objecting to the application and not is there anything that the officers have seen in that longer period to read uh, the, the, this um, amount of uh, literature? See anything in there that, that is any new in terms of relevant planning issues within? Because it, 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 it's sort of very flowery language in some, some respect, but it's talking about the character of the person who, who, who's made the objection, which isn't you know, for the planning committee to decide. Well, it may not get on as neighbours, and that's certainly not the role of the planning committee to to solve those issues as well. Uh, is there anything that I may have missed in there that is new in, 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 in any implications to this application or what was the late, uh, a late list sort of? Yeah, thank you to you, Chair. Uh, th those <coughs> letters were, were submitted to the Council today, um, so we have had a chance to, to quickly look through them. Um, but, but you're right, there's nothing in those letters that we haven't already addressed, in terms of the planning issues anyway. Uh, that we haven't already picked up um, on, on the report. Uh, but if I just go through these photos for you. So th this is the application site. So this is the wall that's been built, and this is the access onto, onto the property. And this is the main, um, the principal uh, objector here. And then this is the wall exactly next door. This is the property immediately um, adjacent. It's one, three, three Seabank Road. 
So the wall, as you can see, is the same height as the one at Block 35, with similar access arrangements onto Seabank Road. Um, this again is a little bit further up Seabank Road. Again, similar height. There's a fence here, um, similar height. And you can just make out here that there is a fence uh, between these two properties that again um, replicates, well, in fact, it's significantly higher than the, the boundary wall between um, 135 and 137 Road. And these, these are just examples of. Um, of boundary walls that follow through um, up Seabank Road. So um, th that just gives it a taste for the committee to see that uh, there are there are other examples on Seabank Road of this type of, of, of boundary wall and access arrangement. David. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the Ward Council was concerned about sight lines and whether this was going to have an effect or increase the hazard or danger of somebody trying to access or egress either of the properties for that matter. Could we just ask the um, highways officer if he has any thoughts on that or whether there's any issue that he feels could have been controlled through this planning application to change or to improve the situation with the sidelines. I think it's something that a lot of people suffer anyway, anyway all over the borough where sidelines because of developments over the years aren't as good as we would like them. But I'm wondering whether there's an opportunity within this application to increase the uh, control we have over that aspect of the application. Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair, we, we looked at this application in terms of the actual application that's been submitted. Um, and, uh, you know, in that regard, um, it's very similar to other accesses along that road and in the area in general. Um, so I don't feel that there's any grounds really to object to this particular proposal. In terms of whether or not um, the arrangements can be improved, and there's always room for improvement, but that's not the application that we've got in front of us, unfortunately. Any further comments? Recommendation to the officers is to approve this, so I don't know if anybody would like to move it. Chair, Chair uh, you know, I, I can understand this quiet uh, and annoying to a, a, a retrospective application, but we've had this would be the first one. We dealt with that. I'd be mind, minded to, to move it through the chair. Uh, unless uh, someone, no one seems to be conformed with any of them. Okay, so, so, so Steve's moved. Has anybody got a second? David, have you got a second one? Okay, the other two recommendations is to prove you've got um, a recommendation that we'd have to look at. Anybody, everybody in favour, please show. We have a presentation of the mayor, number six, please. Fence, fence route. Thank you, Chair. This, this is an outline application for a mixed use development which incorporates a residential, both residential and employment uses. All matters are reserved apart from access, which is included in the outline application. The site is designated as primarily industrial. And as such, a residential development is a departure in principle and in principle contrary to the UDP. Although all matters apart from access are reserved, an indicative layout has been submitted, and this doesn't represent a, a suitable, satisfactory layout and development and best use of the site, it would in, in fact result in a substandard form of development. The residential development of the site would result in a loss of employment land and there is a lack of robust evidence support that supports the proposal submitted with the application. Furthermore, it's not been demonstrated that the development could not be sited elsewhere on sites with a lower probability of, flood, of flooding and for these reasons set out on page 37 it's recommended for refusal. 